And this is just one of those blessings and miracles that I dreamed might happen. And sure enough, it is happening. And my hope is that I can do now on this trip what, what Dizzy, Stan Getz, Earl Hines, and I all tried to do 41 years ago. Hi, this is Ken McCarthy of Jazz on the Tube, and welcome to the Jazz on the Tube podcast. We've got a, just a great call today. A lot of what we do is curate and find great videos. We also find great authors and great producers and great educators and, and just put them in front of you. But today we're going to talk about something that actually Jazz on the Tube is involved with helping make happen, which is very exciting. And those of you that have been following our Cuba work over the last two years know we've been doing all kinds of things, stirring the pot, not really knowing what would come of it, but something I think really wonderful has come of it. And we're going to be talking today with David Amram. And David is going to Cuba in a few weeks, and this will be his first trip in 40 years 40 years plus, and we're going to be talking about that trip, how Jazz and the Tube helped a little bit make that happen, how you helped. I've got to thank all our supporters. You know, if it weren't for the supporters, probably couldn't do all the crazy things I do. So I thank, you know, as, as you listen to this, supporters, know that you are part of this. You helped make this happen. So, David, welcome. Thank you, Ken, and to all those supporters who listen to this podcast and all those supporters who watch and listen to the great music on Jazz on the Tube all the way from the old recordings way back when they first started making them at the beginning of the 20th century, right up to 2018, our new year. Thank all of you for supporting something that gives people the chance around the world not only to hear, but very often to see the people who have created and are creating this amazing music that we call jazz. Thanks, David. And, and I got to tell everybody, David must be the, the biggest jazz on the tube fan. <laughs> I think he, he gets that award and I really, really appreciate it. It's such a huge morale boost because sometimes in, in this internet world, you don't really know what reaction people are having to what you're doing. <laughs> You know, <laughs> tell me about it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah, right. So it's a complex social environment out there. So when when somebody like David takes the time out to to contact us, which he did earlier this year, and and say, hey, I love what you're doing. Keep it up. That just that just means the world. So and thanks to everybody, by the way, who sends letters and emails. That they really really matter a lot. I want to just give people a rundown of of your career, David, for people who don't know all the details, because there's a lot to it. It's always interesting to know the year somebody was born, because that tells you the, the times they have come up through. So, for example, I was born in 59, let's call it 60, which means I was a teenager in the 70s, you know, and that sort of forms you. I was a teenager in the 70s in New York City, and that, you know, living in between the Bronx and New Jersey, and that just kind of forms your personality, you know. And so, David, you were born in, in 1930. And you're a farm guy. You're a farm kid, right? Essentially? Yeah, well, I was brought up in Feasterville, Pennsylvania, until I was almost 12 years old. And that is, uh, was then a place of 200 people. <laughs> it was a bunch of, <laughs> way back then, it was just a bunch of farms. And my first experience hearing jazz, of course, was on the, the radio. But you were able to go and see big bands of theaters, and my uncle took me to the Earl Theater in Philadelphia, 1941, just before my 11th birthday, and I saw Duke Ellington, and I said, wow, I could still remember every second, even seeing what the people were wearing, and how this elegant guy, Duke Ellington, made every single person in that show, in that band, a star for a moment. He had every single person in the band was also a soloist at one point, and he himself was so elegant and so musical and such a great band leader, a true maestro, and that this magnificent music. And then my uncle also took me to hear the Philadelphia Orchestra, and I saw Leopold Stokowski, believe it or not, conducting at mm -hmm. his concert, and that blew me away. So it kind of formed a basis in my life for 
beautiful music. And then I used to mow the lawn at the gas station across the street, and I heard country musicians play. And in the school that we went to, in a place called South Hampton, the public school close to Feasterville, even in the, during the Depression, they had instruments that every kid could take home. And they had people come in and play different instruments and play for the kids. So without knowing it, I was getting a crash course in quality music built to last as a little boy living on a farm. So even though I was in the 4-H and milking cows and doing all that stuff, I also had a chance to see and hear some great music. And I've been doing that ever since. And my jazz on the tube and my internet was the first 70, I'm 87 now, my first 70 some years of my life, my YouTube was at the University of Hangoutology, which is to say <laughs> being lucky enough to be with people who were better than me, knew more than me, and opened up doors for me to understand how to get started in some way in understanding, much less playing or composing, all different kinds of music that really were worthy and were built to last. And we're going to, we're going to talk about some of the, the people that you socialized with and house partied with and, and played with, and it's quite an, an amazing list of people, including Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie and Bud Powell and Thelonious Monk, and on and on the list goes. It's really an, an amazing story. I want to just bring something full circle. You, because I'm kind of a farm-oriented guy, even though I don't have a farm and don't really grow much, but you had a farm up until just a couple of years ago. Yeah, I wanted my kids... When I got married late in life, and I wanted my kids to have the same experience I did of being able to put in a day's work in addition to what else they wanted to do. And I was at a place called Putnam Valley, and for 30 some years we had a little farm on Peekskill Hollow Road. And my kids grew up. I thought perhaps they'd rebel against me and want to become brain surgeons or stockbrokers. And they all ended up having their own bands and doing their own kind of music. So even though they, my son plays with me and he's terrific, and my, my, my kids play with me from time to time, and I back them up with their own bands, they have their own kind of music that they do, which is the way it should be. So I didn't try to make them showcase versions of what I wish I could have become, but rather for them to find their own way in life and to hopefully at least have respect for all those beautiful kinds of musics that I was been blessed to stumble and fumble into and spend my life trying to improve upon. So they they finally, you know, finished high school and went to college. They said, well, Daddy, it's been great being in the 4-H, but we want to go to New York City, just like the song <laughs> in Porgy and Bess. You know, when Bess wants to leave Catfish, we'll right. go to the big city. So they right. all became city billies and moved to Brooklyn before Brooklyn was that fashionable. And I would come and visit them. And then I would see people from Brooklyn my age who remember places called the Kingston Lounge and all these great places where Kenny Durham and Sahib Shahab and Max Roach and Randy Weston and so many other magnificent musicians all either came from or lived for quite a a matter of time. And in the summer of 1956, after I was done playing with Mingus, I would go out to where Matthew G., great trombone player and songwriter, was playing at the Kingston Lounge and sit in and play with these great musicians that I knew, but being more or less where they were in their home environment. And then all mm -hmm. those years, 40 years later, here I am with my kids, and there's only one other person in the whole place as old as me. And they remembered the Brooklyn of that particular era. And I mention that because if you could stay close to your kids, they'll not only show you the world that they're in, but can remind you of the world that you were in. And then very mm -hmm. often you'll be in the same place with, with someone from your generation who also hangs out with the younger generation and see the whole evolving picture and that evolving picture always includes things of beauty things of value things that 
defy fashion and commerce and just have to do with being so valuable that they somehow stay around, even when the rents go up and the fashions change, there's still that beauty, that beauty part that's there. And that's the big thrill. Every time I go and see my kids or hang out with them, and now what they've learned from being brought up on the farm is whatever kind of work they're doing in music, when they have to do something to pay their rent, they do that and put in a good day's work too and they have a good work ethic and they show respect for every person that they meet. Mm -hmm. They're not spoiled brats or snobs or whining blameologists complaining about the fact that nobody appreciates art in America. You know, self-pity, all that stuff. They understand that if you want to do something beautiful in life, that's your choice and it's going to be a struggle and it's worth it and the joy of doing it makes it all worthwhile. And if you can find a way to even get paid, that's even better. But not to allow that difficulty to stop you from doing what you feel you were put here to do. Beautiful. And, you you know, you're, for people that may not know, David really is the living embodiment of that philosophy. And I, I hope if you've got a young person or young people in your life, listeners who love music, make sure they hear this interview and make sure they hear what David just said. <laughs> because there's not enough of that being said these days, and it's really, it's really, really important. And just to put a wrap on the farm angle, because I think it's important for people to know this about you. So in addition to having grown up in a farm life and having his own farm, David's also been a steady supporter of Farm Aid and a performer at all the concerts. So it's just just I think something important important to know because if if we don't have food we can't listen to music so it's great that, that he's been involved in both and you know in other parts of the world food, food and music are really not that separated I have some friends no, over on the other side, yeah I have some friends over on the other side of the river from Africa and they are master drummers from Senegal and Gambia and they also happen to grow their own rice because they think their own rice tastes better they're right by the way they know their own rice tastes better and is healthier for you than what's in the store so they talk about work ethic they're 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 literally harvesting rice by hand during the day and then at night they're playing drums and dancing and it's a it's a fantastic fantastic mix so david you've written 3 books and i and i want to tell you i'm glad you wrote them because there's stuff in, the, in David's books that you're not going to know about or learn about vir virtually anywhere else, and that's snapshots of time in our, our country's creative history. You have the book Offbeat, which is I'm actually going through right now, which is a account of your friendship and collaboration with the great Jack Kerouac. Everybody should read that book. Phenomenal. I really, it's given me so much insight into, into Kerouac's work that I didn't have otherwise. And then the book Vibrations, which is, it's, it's plural, right? Vibrations? Yeah. And that's, yeah, that that's sort of, first one. that's your, yeah, part one. And fabulous. I mean, one of the, one of the great stories, there's so many great stories in that book, but one of the ones that really grabbed me is you were 50, and how old were you when you got your first jazz gigs in, in DC? You used to show up at this place every now and then and, and, and play and get paid with a little orchestra. Oh, yeah, well, there were, there were so many terrific jazz players. Charlie Rouse, who later got known playing when Monk was there. John Malachi, great piano player who played with just about every wonderful singer. And a Latin band, my first Latin game, we played Tinsendale and Monteca. Almost got thrown off the boat where we were working. Buddy Rowell had a Latin, a Latin band that I played with. And I was actually home in the National Symphony. And I used to play at all kinds of jam sessions. So when I was 12 years old, I went to a kid's party, and Lewis Brown, who was mentioned in Duke Ellington's book, Music is My Mistress, who was a mentor of Duke Ellington's, believe it or not, was probably in the 70s, I guess, then, when I met him when I was 12 years old, 1942. And he took me under his wing and invited me down to a, an Elks Club when Washington, D.C. was still officially a segregated city, being in the South during that time. And then I was, it was almost like a revival meeting, being able to play with these master old musicians, 
who extended me so much kindness and friendship and mentorship, but I never forgot that. I always mentioned their names, and I learned to try, just to try, to be like that myself if I were lucky enough to even live long enough to become an older person, which I never suspected that I would. And now instead of being an angry, angry, enraged, embittered wreck, I'm more <laughs> joyous than ever because what I do have, the little I do know, I can try to share with other people and younger people as well and older people who never got a chance to do what they could do to share what I've been shown by others with them just the way these old guys taught me. And of course, as we all know, that was and remains the jazz philosophy. Respect, love, and sharing. That's what the old bumper sticker from the uh, Cheyenne people has. When I played with Floyd Rick Crow Western, he gave me that bumper sticker. He said, just remember that, Dave. That's all you got to know. And I, when my little kids were small, I got them to say a prayer every night and to say respect, love, and sharing the Indian way, which is what the bumper sticker said. But that's also the jazz way. And, of course, then when you really start to study history of New Orleans or the history of America, for that matter, and you find that Native American people, uh, people with part of the Native American backgrounds, like Mary Lou Williams and Cecil Taylor and the great, great uh, trombone player who played with, well, two of them who played with, one was Big Chief Russell Moore, who was Pima Indian, and Jack Teagarden. And you find the, the and all in New Orleans, the whole relationship of, of Native American culture and African American culture, before it was even called that, how that was all part of a similar but spiritually aligned whole, just like we're beginning to find out that Afro-Cuban music and jazz are almost like first cousins or even closer. And while they're totally different, and, and each one, when you say Afro-Cuban music, there's like a hundred different kinds of music you could study. And when you say jazz, good heavens, it's just about everything. You could imagine something new that you study each day. There are roots which are similar, and somehow they can be together. And if I can mention that for your listeners, by together, I don't mean fusion, and I don't mean crossover. First of all, when you play chopsticks on the piano, and you're using two fingers going in different directions, that's already fusion, because you're doing more than one thing. So music is all about putting elements together, just like great cooking or a great menu would be or a great painting or building a great house or planting a great garden. It's many things all being part of that one whole and organizing and putting them together and then letting nature take over. And the same thing's true with crossover. I would say I never was a crossover artist because there's nothing to cross over to. If you're in that <laughs> world of beauty and you take a bridge from one beautiful place to another, you're still in the same place. You're just taking a bridge to a different part of that land of beauty. And the reason I mm-hmm. mention that is business people, when they suddenly saw a demographic, said, okay, we're going to get this demographic over here that we think will buy jazz records and then we'll stick them up there in the Coochie Frito circuit with those people that seem to like that other stuff. They don't even know. When they say Latin music, there's like a thousand different ver- versions sure. of music once you get south of New Jersey, that are, that are, or you could stay in New Jersey for that matter, that are, are so, so vast. And, and they try to merchandise and slop stuff together. That might be okay for a fast food franchise, where by the time the people who eat the crap that they're putting out are, are poisoned, you've already gotten your profit and moved to another country and nobody could fi- you know, find you. But music, art, that's the real deal. And if you're trying to study that, that's one thing. If you're trying to merchandise that and don't even know what it is that you're selling, you can mess up the picture of what it's about. 
and then force people who are gifted to feel, well, I've got to be part of that picture, or I'm not authentic. So the danger with stereotypes and branding is that you can not only change or avoid history, you can actually wreck something beautiful by giving it such a bad image that people who want to do that or learn about that go either go off the wrong tree or they feel they're not being authentic if they don't do what the stereotype is. And the stereotype very often has nothing to do with the reality. Mm-hmm. You know, you, 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 know you covered right. that. I'm, sure in, you, listeners. I'm sorry, David, I cut you off. Oh, oh no. I was, I was going to say that you know that already, and I know your listeners know that. I just wanted to reiterate it. To well, you know, it helps. It helps, sure. to be, it helps to be reminded uh, of of our values, and that that's probably why people go to church. Some people go to church every Sunday. <laughs> you know, it's not new. Uh, it's just a reinforcement and a reminder of of what we're all about. Um, you, Absolutely. You actually, you actually cover that quite a bit. That that topic quite a bit in your book, um, Offbeat, talking about what Jack Kerouac had to go through. Uh, you know, as a very, you know, a serious artist, and next thing he knows, he's a celebrity, and the celebrity didn't help him one bit. Uh, in fact, it, it, it caused a lot of interference and problems in, in, in his desire to be a creative person. So this is something that uh, all creative people have to face, and it's, it's tricky. And uh, if you're going through it, it's not just you. It's, uh, it's the way things are, and you can, you can, ev- you can evade and avoid it. And, and David is yeah. <laughs> living proof. Of, of how you can evade and avoid these traps that they, they try to set for us. Hey, on this Native American theme, if you don't mind, um, I just want to go off on a slight tangent here. Coincidentally, this year, uh, Monk Boudreau, uh, who's a New Orleanian and uh, Mardi Gras Indian, uh, is receiving the Lifetime Achievement Award in music from Offbeat Magazine. And uh, he makes the point that there were a lot of people, some you know, people that have been in New Orleans for a long time, who are part Native American, and um, uh, especially in the in the Mardi Gras Indian society, uh, if people don't know that music, just Google it and check it out. It is some amazing music, mm. and uh, you know it was not popular or even safe uh, for many, 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 many years uh, to be known as a Native American person, especially if you were living in the South. Uh, you were likely to be taken off to a, a reservation against your will. Um, so there are a lot of people. I've even experienced this up here in the Hudson Valley. Uh, I have a friend, uh, Evan Pritchard, that wrote a book called Native New Yorkers, and it's about yeah. the history of the Algonquin people. And he says every time he does a reading of his book, there's always one or two people that stay around till the very end, and they say, they say the same exact story Monk Boudreau says in this article in Offbeat, they say, when my grandmother was, pa- was passing, she took me aside and told me that we're Indians. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know why I'm going off on that tangent, but there's a lot more Native American people out there with, with Native American culture and blood and attitude than we realize in this country because a lot of the people, they just, they don't want to, you know, they, did, they didn't want to talk about it because of the, the risks. But the other, the other issue I want to go off, this is a real tangent, but, you know, the great Sonny Murray passed away recently. And so I was reading a lot of interviews that he did and watching them. And he claims, and this is an amazing claim, but, you know, it comes from Sonny Murray, the great drummer. He claims that the swing beat is a Native American beat. It's from Oklahoma and that that's where it originated. And uh, so... Is that true? Is that not true? I don't know. I, 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 uh, but it's, it's, it's worthwhile reporting that a great jazz drummer believed that one of the core rhythms in, in jazz actually is a Native American uh, rhythm. So, um, well, I thanks think for... I, what I think is, if I can interrupt you, just because I was a, little bit oh, thought Sonny was a beautiful musician and a great, great cat too. The, uh, the stomp dancers that they have, especially the, the, the Greek Muscogee dancers, Jerry Hydro is one of the great stomp dancers, as well as a published poet and a playwright, also plays the Native Flute Champions stomp dancer. When the Oklahoma Jazz Hall of Fame gave me a Lifetime Achievement Award, the um, J. McShad Lifetime Achievement Award, one of the reasons they did was because I was the only living member 
of the great band that Oscar Pettiford had, Julius Watkins and I were the French horn players. And in 1956, we made this recording and everyone else had passed away. And I was out there at the, at the Woody Guthrie Festival and the people who ran up the Hall of Fame found I was going to be there said, look, we want to honor Oscar. And we know that you played with him and you've done all this music. We'd like to honor you too. I said, wow. So I went to this beautiful place in, in Tulsa, which is a few miles from Okamulgee, Oklahoma, which is Oscar Pettiford's hometown where he was part of a family band. I think there were 13 kids and they all were a huge band. And Oscar used to show me, after we were playing in Birdland, he would take me up to his place and put aside his beautiful band leader's clothes. And for your listeners who might be too young to know about it, Oscar was the guy on 52nd Street at the Onyx Club. He was the person who got Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie on the poster. And there's still copies of it you could see in books and online. Oscar Pettiford with Dizzy Gillespie and Charlie Parker, he got them building for the very first time in their life together to be with him downtown on 52nd Street. And wow. Oscar was a heavyweight, great people. He replaced Jimmy Blanchard in, in the Duke's band. And Oscar used to show me stop dance. He would go over, take me to his place after the gig at Birdland when we played with the big band. And he would t get his jeans and put on a t-shirt and get his moccasins from way up and show me all these dance steps and rhythms. And the, what they call the powwow be the go, 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 is very similar to team, chop, to team, chop, to two, to two. It's very similar to what mm -hmm. the Kansas City drummers played when they were playing in what we would call swing. Or music. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of rhythms and a lot of the feelings are very similar. Now, how do you explain that? Well, I'll be the last person, but it was explained to me by someone named Claire Oka, who was Shoshone. And in 1975, I was chosen. Every seven years, the World Council of Churches had a meeting of a hundred to some nations who would all get together. Even though I'm Jewish, I was chosen at this amazing group of, of Christian people from all over the world who came to celebrate the way they worshipped in their style. And all these different countries were there. And, and Claire was the representative of, of Native American people of the Christian faith. And she and I were invited to uh, go and see some Maasai people. And I tell you what, they heard us on a radio show and they said, well, you know, she's a real American. Her family's been there for thousands of years before anybody else showed up in the boat, just like we were here for millions of years, maybe. So we like her. They liked it, that I was playing all the different kinds of music and trying to, and I was at a concert with the musicians for Kenya that invited me to sit in with their band. So anyway, I was just lucky enough to be part of that. So we went to this place where the Maasai people were, and there was this beautiful neck piece. And I said, wow, Claire, that's just like the neck piece that you're wearing. She said, well, you know, she said a lot of our beadwork, she said, we didn't think that we, we came over the Bering Straits and the and emigrated to the United States from another place from Africa. They said, well, I think the reason why they're so similar is because both of our peoples live in a certain way and are connected to certain principles and certain God-given forces, whatever the heck they are, that come up with a similar result and a similar sense of harmony and what's in nature. And therefore, we end up with a similar or the same conclusion. I hope this makes sense to you and your listeners. Yeah. I said, yeah. wow. And she said, so that, that neck, the fact that our neck pieces look almost alike isn't because we were the same people. We were influenced to live with those same 
natural dynamics, those same natural forces. That blew my mind because then I realized, well, there's certain things where we, in music you can feel something and when you go to sanctified church like I did where I was invited by Baron Banner whose father was, was a uh, being sanct having 50 years as a pastor and I went to a jam session I was there at, at a university and they invited me to come down to this wonderful recording studio and the, the guy said, yeah, he said, you know, my brother, he plays with Wayne Shorter and everything. He's familiar with you. They're, they're having, my father's going to be inaugurated. And the organ player who was the jazz person said, yeah, we'd like Dave to come and sit in with the band. So there I was sitting in a band, being a fly on the wall and playing Latin music and jazz. I knew how to cool it and just sit there quietly, do what I was asked to do and not be... Mr. Super Hog, Egomaniac, Napoleon, Super Swine, but just to try to be part of the band, part of the mm -hmm. group, just as mm -hmm. dizzy. When, when uh, he was leading his his band, and a wonderful young trumpet player, 17 years old, came from Philadelphia, just blew everybody away. Dizzy would sit in his third trumpet chair and have him go out and lead the band, showing all of this without saying anything, that the leader is the follower as well, and that a good a good musician could also be a good ensemble player. So I was sitting there quietly, and I, I heard this, the four hours of these incredible sermons and the feeling in there was just like when I heard, when I played in the Box B minor mass as a teenager and they had the crucifixus by Bach and then the et resurrexi that we heard those last sad chords, you know, celebrating the, the, the passing on, on the cross. And then you heard the resurrection and then glorious thing. I said, wow, I could feel I could feel what that was about somehow through box music and what he felt. And I was able to feel at this church service and, and Reverend Brady, or see, I said batter, Brady was his name. I could feel what that was about. Even though I was brought up in that faith, I could feel that it. it was a big natural force. And that's those natural forces, those natural things are in everything. That's why music, when you hear music, you hear music from Cuba, you can feel what it's like being there. And you can hear the parts of Africa. When I finally got to Africa, I heard music that I heard all my life, but I already felt I'd been there through the music. And when you hear a Mozart string quartet, we don't wear white powdered wigs anymore or living castles. All that's gone. But the music retains the essence of the beauty part. And that beauty part permeates everything. And what you see, what he was talking about, Sonny Murray was talking about that, that rhythm was the similarity, the depth of that Native American drumming, which represents the heartbeat and the communication of all living things through that heartbeat. And what comes from, from jazz, which is the same thing. And I say all that because ultimately, you can have all the intellectual stuff in the world and all the knowledge. It really comes down to simple, simple forces of nature and simple things, things of the spirit, which are indefinable and can only be summed up in the vernacular. What it is. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, all mm -hmm. what, they, what they would say, somebody texts a religion, the great unknown. It's really a mm -hmm. mystery, but it's there, and you just got to learn to humble yourself and say, well, boy, that's, that's some heavy stuff. When I played with Mingus, Jackie McLean and I would sit up all night afterwards, and we'd go to Jackie's place till his wife got up at 7 to go to work and say, fellas, I think it's time for you to go to bed. 
and we would really <laughs> sit there talking. You know, and Jackie was such a beautiful, and his wife was so terrific too. And we would sit there talking. And I said one time, I said, you know, Jackie, all the rehearsing we did, and Mingus expects us to read his mind. And then there's that one part when you play, that I play, and answer. He said, stop. He said, stop it. I said, what do you mean? He said, don't talk about that, man. I said, why is that? He said, that's that stuff. That magical stuff, he said, that's what you hope for. You don't want to mess with it. You don't want to mm. analyze it. You mm. don't even want to mention it. You just hope mm. it happens again, so lay off. So then we mm-hmm. talk about something else. And and I say that only because there's some stuff you just have to accept that you can't define, you can't package, you can't merchandise. You can't put on TV and say, you take this course and in 30 minutes, you're going to be a big star. Women are going to throw themselves at you. You're going to be rich and famous and groovy and popular. That's fine. And we're all for progress and commerce, but that's got nothing to do with anything of what we're talking about and what music is all about. Because music celebrates that great unknown, those great forces, those great feelings, and the people who created them, the cultures that they come from, and the part of which we would never know about, but we have to learn to accept so that we can become better ourselves. That's a heck of a thing. Once you see that, then you never have an ego problem because you realize (laughs) You're just another person passing through, and you're lucky enough well, to have been touched by some of that. Well, yeah, on that on that topic, uh, you know, you, you mentioned Dizzy, and he embodied that approach. I mean, oh, no, did nobody, he ever? Nobody was more virtuosic. Uh, nobody knew more theory. Uh, nobody had greater accomplishments, and yet, you know, you described that he would he would put a young guy up front. And listen, you know, instead, you know, give give the, give the other people a, a chance and learn yeah, from he, them. So, uh, you know, he had he had Lee, Lee Morgan. You know, Lee Morgan was the trumpet player I was referring to. Well, Lee was like a seventeen-year-old kid, and mm-hmm. he came up there and did he put him in the second set to lead the band, and he was showing us all. This is about the music, and. But he didn't say that. He just did it. And he sat in the third trumpet chair and had Lee go out and lead the band. So what Dizzy was saying was he was all about the music and that the music was the star. And that's a heck of a thing. And and I never knew anybody. And I met him in 1951. I was 20 then, about to turn 21. I was three years older than Lee then was when, when Lee, when he met Lee, you know, years and years later. But he he was that way with just about everybody. And that's one of the reasons why he was happy almost all of his life, including towards the end when he had just about everything anybody could want instead of becoming, a, you know, a grouchy 14 bodyguards to see the great man, he would just go hang out with anybody and everybody. And in fact, when we would go to his little dressing room, he would give his card to people. I said, Dizzy, that's incredible, because he had his phone number on it. He said, uh-huh. look, he said, I haven't beaten anybody out of anything. I don't owe anybody any money. I don't have any enemies. He said, <laughs> when I came to New York with Cab Calloway, and I was still just a very young fellow, he said, I worship Andre Segovia. He said, he was the baddest guitar player of classical guitar style that we knew about at that time. So he said, just for curiosity, I looked in the phone book to see if there, he had any relatives named Segovia so I could meet him someday. He said, there he was in the phone book. He said, man, if Andre Segovia's in the phone book, I'm never going to have to hide from the world. Uh-huh. So he went right out there. And be- before anybody could be creepy with him, <laughs> He was so beautiful, just say hello first, that they were temporarily uncreeped and became members of the Dizzy Gillespie world for a moment. 
Mm-hmm. And he did that with all of his concerts. He would play on that incredibly sophisticated music, but he had a way of presenting it that was so much fun, everybody felt they were in the inner circle. And when we went to Cuba on that boat ride, and he got a whole bunch of stiff people that didn't want us to even be there at the captain's dinner, got everybody to end up laughing and having a good time. And I said, how are you? It changed it all around. He said, well, he said, I learned a long time ago. He said, you got to create your own environment. And then once it's created, then you can sit back and enjoy being in that scene that you warmed up without anybody even realizing you're the one that warmed it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This, this is, is good, amazing. It, you know, and, and we're, gonna, we're definitely going to have to do another call to talk about um, Dizzy in, in greater detail and also Charlie Parker and Bud Powell and, and Thelonious Monk and all these people that you actually experienced, uh, as, as, not as an audience member, not even as just a, a player, uh, but also just spending time and, and, and getting to know them as human beings. Um, but let's use this opportunity. We're talking about Dizzy. Dizzy was one of the uh, the group that went to Cuba uh, back in 1977. Now 41 years ago. Uh, how did that? Co- and, and you have, by the way, you haven't been back since. Is that right? No. I've been hoping that I could go back someday. And they say in the Bible, all good things come to those who <laughs> wait. And in New York City even if you're not a country boy, and you go there to get a cup of coffee, and you sit for two hours, and they're still not there, and you say to the waitress, uh, I don't mean to be too pushy, but I have to go to work. Could you put maybe that coffee that I ordered in a container, and I'll drink it on the way back to work? Very often the waiter or the waitress will say, what's the rush? (laughs) <laughs> and in a certain, a certain way, <laughs> that's a very good philosophy. So I figured, I hoped, especially while I was still alive, because I didn't want to go back in a in a box or an urn of ashes. <laughs> I, I wanted to go back there in person, hopefully, and and uh, and play some of the music, including my in memory of Chano Posa that I wrote for that trip on the boat, actually, before we were on the way down with Dizzy, saying, get Earl Hines and myself. And I played that at the concert that we did, the first ever musical exchange, in March of, I believe it was, 7th of 1977. I hoped I could go back and do it again. And uh, sure enough, through the miracles that have been my whole life's just serendip hard work and occasional serendipity I managed to stumble into you after being a big fan of the on jazz of the tube for so many years because of, of the Latin connection and then you were able to have made a friendship with Gilberto whom I hadn't seen in 40 years whom I on whose card I'd lost and I thought perhaps he had passed away and I'm sure he figured I must be gone by now and his knowing Bobby Caracasas, whom I had heard of but never met, who's even older than me, and who apparently liked my music all of his life, and by a miracle, they said, oh, we'll have, let's have Dave come down. So in a week, a little more than a week, I'll be, on the 15th, I'll be coming back. It'll be almost 41 years, and it's just a big thrill and a joy, and I figured, how did this ever happen? And I figured, well, the great astrologer (laughs) in the sky, the great career counselor in the sky, is giving me a second time around for a lot of wonderful things, so I encourage young people, try to be healthy so you can live a long time, and if you do, eventually, all the good stuff that you ever put out there we'll come back and you get a second time around for a lot of different things. And this is just one of those blessings and miracles that I dreamed might happen. And sure enough, it is happening. And my hope is that I can do now on this trip what what Dizzy, Stan Getz, Earl Hines, and I all tried to do 41 years ago when we went down with the Carter's uh, administration's 
okay to be the first North American since the revolution to go down to Cuba and play with those wonderful musicians from there who also love jazz and had contributed so much. And we could take what we learned from the Cubans who came to the U.S. and when, when uh, Mario Bowser came and played with Chick Webb and Machito and Celia Cruz and other people came and then later on in the 40s, Candido and other people showed up. They, that music that we all loved back then, a handful of people, now we could come back a second time and since our trip of 1977, which opened up the door, not for diplomacy, they hope, I guess the Carter administration, well, we'll do what Nixon did with the ping pong players in China. We didn't have the political results, but we did have the musical door opening for what already was there expanded. And now when I go to colleges and schools and you say the wow on call, people play the bak, 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 and they can play the four components of the wow on call. And they know who Los Munduquitas de Matanzas and Los Papinas are and a lot of other people. And they can not only do the traditional stuff, they're up to some of the latest things that I never know about until I meet people who from Cuba who come over here or where I see kids in Miami who were younger, who were born in the States, but who stay in touch with the shortwave radio and stuff like that with the newer Cuban music and, and are aware of the stuff that's happening now, which I don't, I hardly know about. I'm still trying to learn what happened in the 1930s, 40s, 50s. <laughs> There's the, the chance to go back, hopefully, and play with a, a new generation of younger players. And I saw on, on YouTube Bobby Carcasas, who I'll be playing with, and his band, half of which are all these young players, are like a monster good players, and went in Rosales one down there and made an amazing recording with his Lincoln Center band and with some of those younger guys who were like scarifyingly good. So it would be a thrill to go back now and try to put out that good feeling that Dizzy Stan Earl and I tried to when we were there for almost 41 years ago. And of course now... There'll be so many great players there that I'll be, as I did 41 years ago, sitting back there and say, wow. I'll never forget when we played with Ira Carey and uh, Arturo Sandoval played this monster trumpet solo up soaring into the stratosphere. Dizzy ripped the white tablecloth off of the table in the little place we were sitting and started waving it like a flag of surrender. <laughs> 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 The trouble for everybody in Ida Caddy cracked up. And Dizzy was saying it in a good nature way. I said, man, you guys are hot. And that's the wonderful thing about, about jazz and all sincere music that we are each other's fans. Mm. Mm. So true. So we're just like the people that listen to your podcast and look who aren't musicians that love the music. We love it as much as you guys do because we're all part of that band and that we're all part of that band of people that are there at the temple of music to celebrate worshiping together. And by worshiping, that doesn't mean groveling and slobbering to a dictator. It means appreciating something of a high power that we're all part of celebrating together. Heck of a thing and very, mm. very healthy. And that, that first trip that you were on uh, was just 36 hours long. That really surprised me when I learned that. You basically, the boat arrived. It was part of a cruise, and one of the ports of call was Havana. And you had you and you and Dizzy and Stan Getz and Earl Father Hines had 36 hours in Havana. So do you remember yeah. uh, how, you used, how you used your 36 hours? Oh, yeah. Well, the boat came in, and people were saying, what are we supposed to do? Because nobody in the Cuban you know, port, and ever had an American ship come in with a whole bunch of people. Mostly, as I recall, as ex-printer tours, they were a lot of people that I met, real nice people from 
Oklahoma and Southern California. A lot of people were, were ranchers and oil people. And they were mostly Lawrence Welk fans, you know, <laughs> or, uh-huh. or, or electronic country music, you know, what, what the country music had become at that point where they kind of tried to merchandise it to that the glitter and forgetting about the soulful funk part of it. Great tradition of all that stuff. And we were on the boat. We were supposed to be playing on the boat. Most of we were just having a good time playing together, having jam sessions, because nobody on the boat was particularly interested in jazz. But when they found out that they, this was going to be a cruise to Cuba, they said, man, instead of going to a cruise to Africa and getting photographed with a giraffe, we could go on this cruise to Cuba and get photographed with a commie. So that was kind of like a different, a different type of a, of a trip to pho- photograph some kind of weirdness in their perspective of things, I guess. So yeah. when we got there, none of the people in the boat wanted to get off the, you know, the, just the port. So Dizzy said, man, come on, Dave, get your penny whistles and your clave. So I went down, the Rebanti and Dizzy and I went down. And I said, Ray, just for the cars, we went bop, 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 bop. And then everybody joined in, because that's one place in the world where you don't have to teach people about the clave, or the three <laughs> different basic ones of the, the, the bark, bop, 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 or bop, 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 the otra vez, as they say, the, the two, three claves, or the three, or the rumba clave, bop, bop. Everybody knows which is which, where and where. So they were clapping along. I started playing the penny whistle and Dizzy was jumping around. And Suddenly, we were having a little, doing what they call wataka, which is just jamming out on the street. And even the police who were there all started having a good time. And we, we, you know, four minutes after we got off the boat, then all the other musicians came down. And we were off and running for the whole 36 hours. And I don't think, I, we went back to the boat to sleep, but I think we probably got two or three hours sleep. We were up for almost the entire 36 hours. <laughs> and I can't, I feel in remembering, reliving all of those experiences, they were so intense and so much fun that to me, it felt like I'd been there for a few weeks, and then I met and saw so many people from Cuba and saw so many people that I knew who played that music who were from New York or what they call the New Rican community of people who were born right there, like Ray Barreto, whom I played with since 1955, when he was a jazz conga player, and Tito Puente, who was born in New York, but who, who mastered Cuban music and the Puerto Rican music, the moment, the plan, and all those things. And the great players from from Panama that I knew, and the wonderful traditional Puerto Rican musicians like Cortillo, who, who, who played the music, and then and Steve Berrios, who was born in New York, but could play all those different things that I played with. And the great Cuban, older Cuban guys like Candido, who got played with since 1955, when he was an opening act for Mingus when I was playing with Mingus, they were in the pool together, and Patato and Chocolate, the great trumpet player. These were Cubans who had come over when way before there was a, a, a revolution. And so to me, all of that came into focus after being in Cuba. And I began to figure, I better learn something since I played that Latin band way back in 1951-52 in Washington. I better learn what the heck this music was about. So I sat down and, and Tito Puente was said, Dad, he said, you know all that stuff? I said, Tito, I don't know anything, man. He said, well, you, you come around, we'll show you. And they used to say, here comes David with his pencil. I'll be there <laughs> writing <laughs> down you know, the, the different which goes with which. If you if you have a three, two, call it pop, pop, pop. Bok, bok. You've got to play cha di cha cha di cha 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 da di da di da da di da, and you couldn't play one that was in a different part of a clave. It was called cross 
clave. Mm-hmm. But you weren't supposed to do that. If you did, everybody would stop and let you know you were messing up. And Candido, who was like the master diplomat and a great friend, and still is just, we saw him, we were, a few weeks ago, we were at the wonderful benefit for the musicians from Puerto Rico, and Candido was there, and also had that magnificent part that you just put up on YouTube, where you could take a drum lesson from him and see how he puts the simple basic things together. We were doing my piece that I had dedicated this dizzy called Havana, New York, and it went da di da di 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 di. And I was going da one di di di. He said, No, no, David, no, it's dos tres, it's tres dos. He said, No, David, it's not a two three, it's a three two. Mm. I said, Gracias al día tú es estar aquí. Thank heavens you're here. <laughs> Penso que es un dos tres, he said. I, mean, I thought it was a two three. And he said in English, he said, could be, but is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the, always the big thing among all of us was, how do you know if it's a two three, a three two, or a, or a, a rumba clave? And I asked Mario Bowser, etc. he was called in the States the Beethoven of Latin music. He was a magnificent guy. And, and I said, Mario he said, he said, everybody asks me that question, David. He said, sometimes I show in an arrangement, we'll put an extra measure and change the clave or we'll have the clave move over a bit. He said, he said, sometimes I'm not even sure. <laughs> I said, you're kidding, man. I said, what do you do then? He said, I asked him a Cheeto. Wow. Was big he doesn't know anything formally about music, he said, but his instinct is perfect. Mm. I said, wow. So it comes down to that. And then he said something else. He said, and today, he said, the young fellow who's here in Paquito de Rivera his instinct is perfect. Mm. And of course, Paquito could write symphonies, could play Mozart and all the great classical clarinet pieces magnificently, and was a terrific jazz player and a, a masterful player of all different forms of Latin music. But even with his great knowledge, you know, technical knowledge in so many areas, he also maintained that instinct. And that's, that's a, that's something that you almost have to be, I would say, born into, not, not born with. Something you have to be born into. And if you spend enough of your life, you can develop that part too. Because ultimately the instinct is, goes back to that great unknown of what is natural. I was with a group called Africa Oye in 1990 at a World Music Festival and I was invited to come down and play with my group and also to conduct the Atlanta Symphony of composers from different places around the world and then end up having a gigantic jam session or what they call in Puerto Rico and Descarga, you know, where everybody would get together I said, okay, for that, we'll just use an E minor, A7. (laughs) Then all the guitar pickers from country music, and even if they got their guitar tuned up and can't figure out how to play two chords, we'd be able to be in the the key and have each each group start off with just a pedal tone and play their stuff, and then we'll go into something with a simple rhythm. Everybody played. It came off great. And all the different African groups that we heard, these were different people from different parts of Africa. And most of them hung out together with the people from their homes and didn't socialize with the other people too much. Not because they weren't friendly. They just didn't do that. You know, they had their own little communities. But then they would get together. Everybody was together. It was really pretty amazing to see how when it came to be music time, that transformed everybody. So we were all 
playing together, but when the separate groups had Victor Lavanegas, who was with me, said, my God, man, that's the Mozambique, that's the Wawan Cole, that's the Boba, that's the Plena, that's the Panamanian Tamborita, all those rhythmical things that we had learned, you know, different patterns from different places. They were all things that came from African music, and these people from Africa weren't copying us. They were doing what they were doing, that they had brought over with them when they came here. And the people from here and from Latin America picked up on that. And that became something that we learned. And actually here we were hearing people playing it who had brought that over with them when they came here or people had heard them now and brought it over with them the way Duke Ellington would bring music back from all the places he visited. And it was pretty amazing to see how certain roots and certain fundamental things are maintained, not with an anthropologist or an ethnophonchologist put it in, in a bottle of formaldehyde and then merchandise it in one drop at a time, but just by being passed on lovingly by people who cared about it. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things that makes Cuba so unique culturally is that it's a relatively small island. You know, it's not even as big as Florida. Mm-hmm. And you had all these different African nations uh, put pushed together by circumstances, something that didn't happen in Africa. You didn't have people from the Congo and people from, from Senegal typically meeting, certainly not living next to each other uh, in the old days. Uh, but on Cuba, they were all together, and you had this tremendous, we'll use the word fusion, uh, uh, a sharing of uh, different African styles and them all being integrated together into a, a musical culture. And then you're referring earlier to the clave. How do you know when you're in clave? Well, if you grow up in that environment and you're immersed in it literally from birth, literally from the womb, uh, you will know where the clave is supposed to be, uh, oh, yeah. where you're supposed to be in relation to the clave. You'll just know. And so it, it is intuitive, but it's intuitive based on tremendous amount of exposure, uh, just oh, the way we yeah. speak English, right? I mean, our, when we speak English, we're, we're really – no. I didn't go to English classes when I was an infant, right? Uh, you didn't either. Uh, we just – we live in the environment, and we just pick it up. So uh, Exactly. Yeah, and that's what that's one of the um, amazing things about Cuba is you have this, as you'll as you'll be reminded of when you're there. This time for a week, I'm glad to say you you, you won't you'll, you'll actually be able to sleep <laughs> every night, uh, and, and not you'll too have much, a, yeah, not too much. Uh, uh, but instead of 36 hours, you're going to have seven days, uh, seven 24-hour days. Uh, to really uh, get around and absorb it. And you're going to be uh, playing in the Havana Jazz Festival, thanks to Gilberto and Bob. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm I'm just so thrilled just to be there and to be part of that and to be around that and be able to, to listen as well as to play and share a little bit of what, what I know and to learn more. And then whatever I try to learn there, I'll try to pass on. When I get, I, I wouldn't say back home, but back to my many homes, which is wherever usually I'm crashing out for the night. And also try to put that in my music and from where I'm, I'm doing the third movement of a concerto writing for violin, cello, and orchestra called Partners. First movement for Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger, both of whom I knew who, with musical partners and influenced each other and a whole generation of people about the beautiful rich musics that they celebrate. The second, Billy Holiday and Lester Young, who were great musical partners, and I was lucky enough to know both of them. And those two movements, and now the third movement, this is way before I ever found I was going to come back to Cuba, is for Machito and Celia Cruz, both of whom mm. came to the United States a long time ago and brought that magnificent music with them. And my hope is that I can take some of that spirit of, of now in, in Cuba and be inspired to do something to honor them whom I knew so long ago. And 
I should mention too, I'm not taking stuff that Lester Young or Woody Guthrie or Basito played because that's already classical. My hope mm-hmm. is that this piece, among other things, will get some of the classical folks maybe to buy a Lester Young record or a Machito record or say a Kuz record or listen to Woody Guthrie. And more than that, celebrate the cultures that these people all came from and that they supported and loved. And just try to capture the, use the, their spirit of, of partnership and sharing. That's, that's my hope of what the piece will accomplish. In a classical vein, not a pop schlock crossover, you know, orchestrating what's already great without an orchestra being there. But to use that just the way Bartok and Stravinsky and Tchaikovsky and all those great composers of the past used, and the voice you know, used their, and George Gershwin used the folklore music that they knew about as a basis to create something else. So my hope is that will be part of this as well. And already in, in working on the last movement, I'm already hearing stuff in my head, imagining what it will be like when I go to Cuba. And of course, the thing is, when you think you know something and you spend the last 40 some years like I did learning about those fundamentals that people from Matanzas or anywhere else in Cuba already are born, as you mentioned, brought up with knowing. Now, when you hear Los Muñequitos de Matanzas or you hear the great Corchao, one of his wonderful records, Victor Venegas and I were sitting there for hours listening to a 16 bar introduction. I was couldn't figure out how in the heck you could count that. But easily, Lopez, who was the name of Quachao, his real name, who now was the, the principal bassist in the Havana Symphony years ago, but also master Latin bass player, uh, they all had the clave built in. So when we when we had the great jam session at the very end of our 36 hour stay, guess how high is Dizzy and myself, after we had done our particular session, we were all sitting there at the final thing, I think we were playing Manteca, and there was a huge drum solo from Los Papinas and all the other guys, they were playing, they were wailing, and then all of the Americans suddenly stood in a circle, we didn't know where, where to come back in. <laughs> Dizzy finally turned and he said, in his inimitable style, Dondo es uno, por favor, baby. It was, where is one, please? Mm. And Paquita went back, 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 clap the club, and then we knew where we were. Because the basic four parts are the chopper, 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 chop, chopper. No one was playing that. No one was playing back, 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 back. Or no one was playing back, back, Or their cowboy part. And any, all those four fit together, and any one of those four, you'll know where the one is, because you know that pattern. Nobody was bothering to play those four patterns, because everybody knew that. They were playing stuff around that. So it was like being in an algebra class or an mm. astrophysics uh, <laughs> division of trigonometry and beyond where they, everybody, nobody was saying, run, spot, run, roll over, two and two <laughs> equals four, and Jack and Jill went up the hill. They were, nobody was dealing with the fundamentals. We were at, they were out there doing something else. And when you hear Los Muñequitos de Matanzas, you say, oh man, I thought I knew how this stuff was created because they already got all that down. So they're playing from the fundamentals some other stuff that's just so magnificent. And then the, you hear the coro, the singing part come in, and you see the dancer, and you say, wow, what you thought was understanding, you only knew the basic structure, you know, you could see the hole the building was being built built in, and maybe the the basic structure to of what was going to be the first floor of the building, but you didn't see the whole thing, you weren't in the building, 
you had just seen the very, very beginning of the structure. Mm-hmm. And I, I just say that people, if they say, well, man, I, I like to learn how to dance some of the loud music or sing some in the chorus and some of those things, or I want to learn how to play there conga drummers are learning the structure. There's a whole lot, as, as Elvis Presley's famous song went, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. There's a whole <laughs> lot of stuff, structures to learn. And those things keep changing. So I hope is if I go back to Cuba uh, again, hopefully I won't have to wait another 40 more years, because by that time I'll be uh, 100 and, what would that be, a seven? 127 years old. It <laughs> might be too hard to retain everything. So hopefully I get back before then. I'd like to go to Matanzas and, and see where all that not only came from, but is still coming from. One of the beautiful things I saw, on, I think it was on your, on Jazz on the Tube, was showing Los Papinas today. And there's only one person, Yesu, he's the only one of the four Abru brothers left from that I played with 40 years ago, and everybody else is, is their kids and younger people in their family, and they're monstrously good. And I said, boy, that's just, they're just keeping that going. But now they got some other stuff, and, and it was just so um, wonderful to see the music continuing and being continued with another generation that's taking it another notch further. That's what so we're going to see. It's very exciting to go there. And That's I can also, gonna... also say to your listeners, too, if anybody's looking, all those people who listen to podcasts and, and go and jazz on the tube, if you're told by a career counselor, a fashion expert, a psychiatrist, a guru with a limo, or a dope dealer, that what you're doing isn't trendy and fashionable enough, just remind them of what the greatest, hippest, 19th century rapper John Keats said in his ode to Grecian art, he said, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. Mm. And the part mm. that they excerpted was, and as far as all that other trash, forget about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I, you know, you've been, You've you've had these amazing experiences and and you've known all these people and you've been a serious student of Latin music your virtually your whole life and uh, you've you had those thirty six hours in uh, in Cuba and uh, I think uh, this week this that's coming up fairly soon uh, is going to blow your mind because nothing can prepare anybody. For the music of Cuba, it's just as you, it's it's rocket science. Um, yeah, and 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 it says I can tell you, having been there three times in the last year, uh, and been around a little bit, it it's as uh, alive um, as ever. You know, it's it's completely vital. It's not uh, some old time thing that that's faded away. It is completely vital, uh, and it's like the sun. You know, it's still burning bright. Um, mm. Hey, just to just to wrap this call up, um, I, I want to thank all the people that made this possible. And, and when I say this, I'm talking about David getting back to Cuba after 41 years and going back in a way that he's going to be able to meet lots and lots of people very easily. Um, and it, it's sort of a chain of events that took place. And I just want to thank everybody. Uh, first of all, Matt uh, Garrity, uh, we if you're a Long-time Jazz on the Tube listener, you know, we did an interview with him about his Trade Winds project where he goes to, you know, places like New Orleans and San Juan and Brazil. Uh, he went to Africa, I mean, excuse me, in Africa. Well, he went to Cuba, and I interviewed him about it, and he was kind enough several months later uh, to drop me a line and said, hey, Ken, there's some kids coming up from Havana, uh, thanks to uh, Horns to Havana, and Jazz at Lincoln Center, you should try to meet him if you can. So it was very nice of him to do that and uh, think of me. And so I went down and I, I met uh, Camilo, and everybody knows we've been uh, working with Camilo Morera uh, down in Cuba. He's a very gifted composer and arranger, and he's teaching jazz to the kids down there. And so Camilo and his family 
showed me the ropes, you know, down there in Cuba. It is not simple, <laughs> which is why I wrote a 33-page book about it. It is a complicated place to visit uh, if you want to have uh, a smooth experience. Uh, so they were they were great hosts to me. And then uh, by virtue of being down there and being comfortable, I was able to roam around. And uh, through that, I met uh, Gilberto Valdez. And uh, we hit it off uh, as friends, and we spent great time together and have been communicating ever since. And when I met you, David, I, I said, hey, David, remember when you went to Cuba? Do you remember a guy named Gilberto? Because Gilberto was the official government host. He's a great musician, but he was also um, somebody who was involved in the society there at a high level. And he said, oh, you know, David, you said, yeah, I know Gilberto. And I said, Gilberto's alive and well, you know. And um, so I wrote Gilberto right away, and I said, David Amram, I was so happy to hear your name. And uh, one thing led to another, and next thing we knew, uh, David's invited to perform uh, in the Havana Jazz Festival in 2018, uh, just coming up soon. So I want to thank all those people whose generosity, basically, uh, made it possible. And I also want to thank uh, the people who support Jazz on the Tube. Uh, it gives me a little bit of breathing room that I can do crazy things like go to Cuba three times in a year and poke around not knowing what I'm going to come up with. And uh, I feel we've come up with something very good <laughs> uh, in, in, with this. And what I'm hoping, and I, I don't even really need to hope because I know it's going to happen, uh, David's going to be such a great ambassador for all of us uh, and it's going to open so many doors just naturally when we're down there. It's going to really strengthen and broaden our connections to Cuba, and that's something that all Jazz on the Tube listeners are going to uh, benefit from. Um, so, David, we're God, we're in the countdown phase. Uh, do I have my calendar handy? Uh, today is we're recording this on the 12th. No, no, excuse me. Thank God it's, not, it's the 5th. I hope it's the 5th. Yeah, we're recording this on the 5th, and basically. Uh, less than 10 days, uh, we're going to be on separate planes, uh, you from New York, me from uh, Florida, because I'll already be down there, uh, heading to Havana. <laughs> uh, and this is the great adventure. And um, very, I'm so happy all this happened to work out so beautifully. And, and uh, we're going to have a report when, when, when David's back and has had time to settle in and we've had time to digest the experience. We're going to have a second uh, interview, and we're going to talk about what, what went on uh, in, in Havana. So um, I want to thank everybody who tuned in and uh, li listened to this call. Uh, it was very interesting for me. It's always interesting to talk to David. And, and if you have a young person in your life who loves music and is a little worried about the future of music and maybe their future in music, I think this would be a great interview to listen to. Uh, and, and I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend David's books, Vibrations, Upbeat, and Offbeat. They're a real model for what's possible when you go through life focusing on respect, love, and sharing. So, David, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to, to share these reminiscences with us. It really uh, it just makes us all richer. Well, I thank you. You know, I thank you for the, all the work that you've done for the years that I've watched Jazz on the Tube and studied it myself and got to see some of the people whom I knew personally who were not only heroes but mentors and then to be able to see and hear some of the things that they did like seeing Art Blakey and Thelonious Monk and Kay Wendig and Sonny Stitt and Al McKibben all playing together in Denmark and finally getting to hear and see Arnett Cobb playing things that I never heard him do and so many hundreds of other things that when I just see I say oh my god man and I finally can understand people that I knew 30, 40 and 50 years ago and see and hear them at their best in things that were never available here unless you were there and then to see all the young people today not only my own kids but people who are teenagers who are like monster musicians as well. What a blessing for people of all ages to have an option, an option to go through what I call the penitentiary of bad tastes yard and see people whom you would never get to meet, see or hear, and be able to study them 
then to turn off the computer and go hang out and find out you're not the only person in the world who sees that there are things of beauty built to last forever. And to tell all the parents who might be listening, if their kids want to be or study musician or study jazz or Latin music or play in a symphony orchestra, all of those things require so much discipline and effort and hard work. But they're so beneficial, not just with the joy of being able to, to do something with others of a higher level, but also if you want to be a doctor, a dentist, a plumber, a parent, a good citizen, someone who can be a worthy contributor to our society, all these kinds of musics give you the tools for a lifetime of devotion and study and doing better than expected and doing more than you think you're capable of doing and having a higher purpose and the old-fashioned ethics of doing a good job and doing it well and having respect and joy with and for other people. Those are heavy things, and music teaches you about that, so it's its own reward. And to remind their kids, whatever you do to pay your rent has no bearing on your value as an artist or a person. Secondly, in our society, what you deserve and what you get have nothing to do with one another. So just go out there and try and be terrific anyway. And when you're told that you can't do it, you're unqualified. You have no reason. There's no demographics. Hang out with somebody else. <laughs> I have someone who encourages you to do it, and you have a much better life. Beautiful. Beautiful. Well, thank you, David, and, and I'm really looking forward to our next call where we'll be recounting uh, all the great things that happened in, in Havana. Terrific, and I'll look forward to seeing you and thank all your listeners for supporting this great thing. It makes it worthwhile having a computer just to go on jazz on the tube and remind myself what a joy it is to be alive.